We've just read from the 10th chapter of the Acts of the, uh, uh, the Apostles. It's a wonderful instance of the example of the need that we all have for a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation that's available through him. We read in an earlier chapter in Acts, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And devout as Cornelius was, it was necessary that he should be brought to hear words whereby he might be saved. Now, it's a beautifully simple and yet it's an intriguing story. But there's more to it that, than that. Because unless we understand and appreciate the background to that story, then we're going to miss much of the power uh, that this incident in Acts chapter 10 uh, draws to our attention. So I want to go back to the Old Testament now. And I want to go back to the time when Israel came out of Egypt Way back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God said these words to his nation. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So they were to be a, a holy people, a special people, a separate people. And when the nation entered the land that had been promised to them, they were to maintain that separateness. They weren't to, to associate with the nations whom they conquered. They were to be a separate and distinct people. And more than that, they were to show forth the praises of the one who had called them to be his people. So as the people of God, they were to exhibit God's characteristics, both nationally and as individuals. Now as we continue to read the Old Testament, we, we know that that nation failed. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, foresaw that ultimate failure. And he speaks about it in Isaiah chapter 4. Five, and this is our first oh, has it gone off again so Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1 um, I think we're going to have to forget this screen it doesn't seem to be working it's on mine here but uh, it's not on the screen so we'll just carry on if we turn to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1 we read these words Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared it out of stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned. And break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. And then an explanation. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. For he looked for justice. But behold, oppression for righteousness. But behold, a cry for help. And Jesus picks up 
and he recalls that prophecy of Isaiah um, and the records in Matthew chapter 21 and let's hope that comes up so this is Jesus' commentary on this here another parable he said there was a, a certain landowner who planted a vineyard yes and he set a hedge around it dug a wine press in it and built a tower and he leased it to the wine dressers and went into a far country now when the vintage time drew near he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit and the vine dressers took his servants beat one killed one and stoned another again he sent other servants more than the first and they did likewise to them then last of all he sent his son to them saying they will respect my son but when the vine dressers saw the son they said among themselves this is the heir come let us kill him and seize his inheritance so they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him therefore when the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do to those vine dressers Uh, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease their vineyard to other wine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected is become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Whosoever shall fall on this stone will be broken, but on whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But, they, but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes, because they took him for a prophet. So in that... Uh, parable of Jesus we see the end of God's forbearance he will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen but even so Jesus continued to preach to the nation of Israel Peter along with the other disciples was with Jesus during his ministry and these men, no doubt, would remember the words of Jesus as he sent them forth to preach. Matthew 10, verse 5, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Peter would, no doubt, be standing with his Lord when that woman of Canaan came to him with a request for help for her daughter. Uh, the uh, quotation is in an earlier chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter uh, 15. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, no doubt in the verses which follow that there is a foreshadowing of what we're going to be thinking about this afternoon. God, of course, knew what Israel would do. And the cutting off of Israel and the opening up of the way of life to non-Jews, the, the Gentiles, in other words, was prophesied in chapters in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 32, we read, They have provoked me to jealousy, with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people, and I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. But this background died hard. 
they were the people of God as we've read the surrounding nations were classed as dogs and we must bear that in mind as we think about this incident in Acts chapter 10 so what about Cornelius well we read in verse 1 that he was a man of Caesarea a centurion of the band called the Italian band he had in his command a hundred men and that was the sixth part of a cohort a Roman legion was in these times was divided into ten cohorts so that the nominal strength of the legion would be about 6,000 men the, sen the soldiers over which Cornelius was centurion were the necessary troops to support the state and the authority of the Roman representative who at that time was Herod Agrippa whom Claudius had made king over Judea and Samaria. They would, in effect, act as his bodyguard. Well, despite the picture that this might bring to our mind, we read that he was a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, giving much alms to the people and praying to God always. So although a Roman, Cornelius was a worshipper of the true God and his earnestness had also influenced his household. He in turn had been influenced by the Old Testament scriptures and he could have hardly failed to hear something of the teaching and the miracles of the Lord Jesus. He had an honest and a good heart. He was one ready to receive the good seed. He turned to the light and therefore more was given to him. Cornelius, we read, observed the Jewish stated hours of prayer. And he did more than that. His practice was regulated by a higher standard than many calling themselves Christians. And the importance of this conversion is shown by the vision being told three times. Here at the beginning of uh, Acts chapter 10, later in verses 30 to 33, and again in the 11th chapter of Acts and verse 13 to 14. And this fullness of detail is little short of that as in the case of the Apostle Paul's conversion. However, it was necessary that Cornelius should be shown the truth by Peter, who we read in verse 28, had also been taught a lesson that God was to open the way of salvation not only to his chosen people Israel, but to all those who believed in Christ his son, and who trusted that through him they might have hope of everlasting life. And whilst praying at about the ninth hour, and incidentally that would be about three o'clock in the afternoon, Cornelius has a vision in which he sees the angel of God who tells him that his prayers had been answered and instructing him to send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, surnamed Peter, who lodgeth by the sea with Simon a tanner. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Well, Peter, you remember, was passing through that area and was with the saints at Lydda when they received news that uh, Tabitha, known as Dorcas, had fallen sick and who had died at Joppa. And immediately the believers at Lydda arose and went to Joppa where uh, Peter performed the miracle of raising Tabitha from the dead. And it looks as though that's died as well. So um, we'll turn to Acts chapter 9 now and verse 39. Let's read this account. Acts chapter 9 and verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing the tunics and garments 
which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. Now verse 8 of Acts chapter 10 tells us that Cornelius did as God had commanded him. And he sends three men to Joppa, a distance of some 40 miles from Caesarea. What faith this man had. We read in Proverbs 15 that the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. And how true that is in the case of of Cornelius well the next day Peter too received a vision from God which was to alter his whole attitude to preaching the gospel to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews because he sees a sheet knit at the four corners filled with all manner of four footed beasts creeping things and fowls of the air and the voice came to him rise Peter kill and eat and although Peter was hungry he replied not so Lord for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean and this happened three times with the voice replying each time what God hath cleansed that call not thou common now we read in Genesis concerning the double dream that Pharaoh the king had had and the interpretation of that dream by Joseph that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh because the thing was established by God and God would shortly bring it to pass so how much more emphatic then is a dream not only doubled but repeated three times. You see, Peter was to be left in no doubt whatsoever about God's intention. But even so, we can still appreciate how difficult it must have been for Peter to come to a decision to preach to a non-Jew, to a Gentile. So we go back to Acts chapter 10 and verse 17. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, Three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Yes, those two household servants and soldier had found the house where Peter was and were now ready to escort him back to Caesarea. And Peter makes himself known to these men and he asks what is the cause whereof ye are come. Well, after lodging them overnight, they make that long journey back to Caesarea, where we read that Cornelius is watching and waiting for them. And when he sees them, he falls down at Peter's feet and he worships him. That's a lesson for us, isn't it? Are we in love with the truth as much as Cornelius was is our love of God so strong are we so keen to hear the message of salvation and live our lives according as we are instructed well we see now that Peter's vision had altered his attitude to preaching to other nations because we read in verse 28 
these words. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And yet he still asks Cornelius why he sent for him. And verse 30 tells us how Cornelius tells Peter of his vision. That he was told his prayers had been answered. And that he was to send for Peter who would tell him what to do. And verse 33 tells us that Cornelius gathered his whole house together. Now therefore we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. We're eager to learn, in other words. And then Peter goes on to give that wonderful summary of the will and the purpose of God. How that God is no respecter of persons and how that in every nation he accepteth everyone that feareth him and worketh righteousness. So, what are the lessons then for us so far? Well, firstly, think about Cornelius and his exemplary character. Verse 2. A devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. If only we could have such a testimonial. And yet there was something lacking, wasn't there? Verse 6. Send for Peter. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. You see, humanly speaking, there didn't seem anything to improve on this man's character. But from God's point of view, there was. There was something lacking. A more perfect understanding was required. Obedience. And then baptism. And any one of these without the other. Is of no value. What's the first point? The second point is. The way in which God hears the prayers. Of those who seek him. But more than that. Influences events. To bring about his will. Think of the life and the prayers of Cornelius. That vision that Peter had had, the threefold vision. The immediate response of both Cornelius sending his servants and Peter going with them when he, were, when he met them. And finally, in verse 44, the gift of the, the Holy Spirit while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word to place the matter beyond all shadow of doubt. Well, the, the Apostle Paul brings all these points uh, together in the Romans, in his epistle to the Romans and chapter 10. If we turn to Romans chapter 10 and start reading at verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. 
but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, their sound, yes indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. And I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by them who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary a people. And there we have the whole story, don't we? Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The lesson which we've seen this afternoon, Peter learn. And in verse 14, how shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they hear without a preacher? And we've seen this brought home clearly to us in Acts chapter 10. Peter going to Cornelius's house to expound to him the scriptures so that in verse 47 of Acts 10 we see the ultimate act of obedience on the part of Cornelius and his household can any man forbid water that these should not be baptised which receive the Holy Spirit as well as we and he commanded them to be baptised in the name of the Lord so how thankful then we should be that this way has been opened to each one of us, just as it was to Cornelius. In the uh, words of the Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesians, we're just, this is our last quotations, um, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, we read these words. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And it's our prayer this afternoon that all those here today may hold fast to that truth, that faith, and have a... a commitment and a desire to live a Christ-like life and have a, a truth that's as strong as that of Cornelius's, so that when the Lord Jesus returns to this earth to set up his kingdom we may all be granted a place therein. Thank you.